first recognition of anything. My grandmother uh, lived with us and didn't speak English, and the only hearing person in the room, in the house, was my grandmother who spoke German. So my first awareness was probably of German um, as a language and Germany of, as a place that sort of was out there and came to realize that you know there was this person named Hitler and there was this terrible thing that forced uh, my parents and a lot of other people to come to America. You know as I got older some of the stories were told but I don't know you know but but you aren't ready to sort of hear about that kind of cruelty or, or re recognize that it was even possible until you're ready, until, you know, you, you can't conceptualize that um, as a child. And so, you know, you only start to recognize it as you get older. And the same stories pick up a different texture because you are now, you know, you now can look around and see that that kind of cruelty exists in your world the same way it existed in theirs. And, and so you have some context for it. Many of the stories that I've heard my mother tell tonight, this, you know, today and this weekend, were stories I had heard. But they became more powerful or they became uh, more a part of me as I was able to make them part of me. You know, the, the statistic, six million Jews. And I remember, I remember, um, I remember the, the first time somebody said that there were eight million people lived in New York City. And I remember sort of like looking around and saying, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And everybody I saw for months, I go, you're dead, you're dead and just trying to understand what that number was that everybody I saw in the subway and everybody I saw in the street because I, how, how, do you, how, do you make, how do you make sense of it today? And so, um, and so a lot of it is just your being able to mature into the story. But Berlin had become something that I I wanted to see. I, I didn't know exactly what it was. It had to do with what Berlin was today as a city of art um, and what it had been. And I just wanted to, to, to go there. And it's a really interesting place in some way, you know, because it's so much about today and so much about yesterday at the same time. Peter Eisenman uh, had just completed a uh, um, uh, a commemorative, a, uh, uh, a two-acre plot with 2,700, 20, I think 2,711 uh, large cement plinths that were of varying height, and you just could walk between them, very narrow, and some were as tall as 10, 12 feet tall, and some were shorter, and you could walk through them, and you could see the sky, you know, amongst them, and you absolutely felt like you were in your grave, looking up at your stone. And we had just been to the Jewish Museum the day before, which was not a museum I liked very much. And then downstairs there was this museum that, that had all of the emotional resonance of what the Holocaust, with so much less information. The early photographs have the names of people. You can see the insult that happened to this particular person and that particular person who was forced to, to wash the, uh, the, the bricks of, of a street, and that particular person whose store was taken from them, and, and that person who was separated from his family, and you get to sit in those people's lives. And as the photographs continue, they become less personal, and now it becomes about numbers. And you see piles and piles of dead bodies as if they were cordwood um, stacked on top of each other and that is how the progression of that um, exhibition went along and and there were words there was another room that had huge blow-ups of words 
uh, of people in concentration camps who were writing things hoping that somebody someday might be able to get these, you know, receive these words. And it was just heartbreaking. I, I mean, I walked out of there shattered. We went back to the hotel um, some, you know, uh, hours later, and um, uh, they had a, 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 a spa on the, on the on the roof. And I and I put on my uh, my iPod and I was just listening to music and um, um, and this song, cry, you know, um, smile when your heart is breaking came up. And at that point, everything that um, I'd been holding on to that day just came you know, bursting out of me and I started to cry. And um, uh, and, and in trying, and I, I didn't know why, I didn't understand, I mean, I, certainly I knew where it had come from, but I didn't know why those words had that impact on me. And, and, I, and, I, and I collected myself and just thought about it. And I realized that it was about, you know, you. It's about my mother who, um, who had lived through that period, who had been, you know, whose whose personal history was in that room, were in those rooms, and um, who I had never seen exhibit any bitterness or anger, um, had not held on to that as a way of, of separating herself from whatever joy was around. And, and I realized that I didn't know whether I had the strength to be able to do that, to be able to live through that kind of inhumanity and still be able to see what was good and positive and loving about humanity and about the people in the world. I, you know, I just didn't know whether I could do that. Um, but, you know, I, you know I, I have always felt that, um, you know, that there was this light that you know, that you have, and I don't know where it comes from. It certainly doesn't come from your history. It comes from some other place. I'm 59 years old, and I think for the first time, I can listen to those stories and have the emotional bandwidth to be able to feel them fully. You know, um, I think that I think the first times that I heard them, I just, I, you know, I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't, I, I just couldn't deal with it, and, um, uh, you know, and so, um, you know, so it's taken me this long to really like allow those stories in.